during a time when the world, including our hemisphere, is experiencing the greatest displacement of people since World War II. DHS has toughened our border enforcement and is maximizing our available resources and authorities. In the last 11 months, we have removed or returned more than 630,000 individuals who did not have a legal basis to stay, more than in every full fiscal year since 2013. The President's budget would further expand these efforts. It provides $25.9 billion for CBP and ICE, including funds for hiring more enforcement personnel. A separate $265 million would be used by USCIS to bolster refugee processing as we continue to expand lawful pathways and ensure that protection remains accessible for those who qualify under our laws. Our immigration system, however, is fundamentally broken, including our asylum system that so significantly impacts the security of our borders and the processes we administer at it. Only Congress can fix our broken and outdated system, and only Congress can address our need for more Border Patrol agents, asylum officers and immigration judges, facilities and technology. Our administration worked closely with a bipartisan group of senators to reach agreement on a national security supplemental package one that would make the system changes that are needed and give DHS the tools and resources needed to meet today's border security challenges. We remain ready to work with you to pass this tough, fair, bipartisan agreement. Finally, extreme weather continues to devastate communities. Last year, FEMA responded to more than 100 disasters. Our budget provides $22.7 billion to assist community leaders and help survivors in the aftermath of major disasters, and additional funds to invest in resilient strategies that will save lives and taxpayer money in the decades to come. Essential to our success across all mission sets is our department's ability to recruit and retain a world-class workforce. In addition to the frontline border workforce I mentioned, the President's budget includes $1.5 billion to maintain our commitment to fairly compensate the TSA workforce continuing the long overdue fiscal year 2023 initiative we worked together to implement. I look forward to working and further discussing with you these critical missions and our department's needs for both the coming and current fiscal years. The recently passed 2024 budget, though welcome and helpful to many of our operations, was enacted too late to implement an appreciable hiring surge. It reduced by 20% much needed support for cities dealing with migrant related challenges and it cut critical research and development funding, the compounding effects of which our department will feel for years. I am eager to work with you to address these and other shortfalls in the weeks ahead as I am eager to deliver together the sustained funding, resources and support that the extraordinarily talented and dedicated public servants of DHS need and deserve. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. <clears throat> I now recognize myself for questions. Secretary Mayork, as, as I've already mentioned, the non-detained docket has grown at an unprecedented and unsustainable rate. Because this administration refuses to use its executive authority to deter illegal migration and mitigate this chaos, we know that the non-detained docket caseload will only continue to rise. Again, for reference, only 1.3 million of the more 7 million cases on the non-detained docket have been adjudicated and ordered removed. What's your plan to remove the more than 1.3 million migrants who no longer have a legal basis to remain in this country? And how long will it take you to effectuate every single removal order? Mr. Chairman, uh, this administration in the last 11 months has removed or returned more than 630,000 people, more than in any fiscal year since 2013. We take our enforcement responsibilities very seriously, and we have only increased the enforcement efforts over past efforts. I will respectfully submit to you, Mr. Chairman, as I articulated in my opening statement, that the bipartisan uh, bill that a group of senators worked on, I had the privilege of being seated with them, would have delivered a consequence regime like no other. It would have been the first time since 1996 that our broken system would have delivered the much needed fixes that we need to fully enforce the law and to deliver a consequence regime that will indeed deter illegal migration. Uh, that's a great answer, but 
what are you going to do about the people who are still here? Do you have a plan in place to get remove those people on an orderly basis? We certainly do, and we continue to execute on that plan. It is through that effort that we were able to remove or return 630,000 people over the past 11 months. We will continue to accelerate those efforts with the resources we have. Our proposed budget seeks additional resources, not as many as the bipartisan legislation would have provided to us. But you don't have that legislation, sir. So how can you justify using ICE detention space for border decompression efforts when the department has such a large volume of interior enforcement needs? Uh, Mr. Chairman, we use uh, our detention capabilities to ensure that our enforcement priorities are realized. And our greatest enforcement priorities are to ensure that individuals who pose a public safety or national security risk to the American people are detained. That is our highest detention priority. Well, I can tell you that the two people who were recently murdered in Ohio by aliens, uh, their families aren't gonna accept that as an answer. I recognize Mr. Cuellar for any questions he may have. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Mr. Secretary, let's talk about the um, uh, migrants who are released into the country after they've been processed and vetted by Border Patrol. Um, one of the tools, uh, legal tools that you have at your disposal is the use of expedited removal. And I do agree with you, if Congress would do its job and pass a Senate bill that I think is the first time since 1996 that we actually make some changes, especially looking at the asylum criteria. And again, as I've said, five reasons, political, religion, et cetera, et cetera, persecution by the state. You know, I was just at Poland Institute in, in Laredo and we're talking to the folks there and they said that most of them are coming in for economic reasons, even though they say asylum, but it's economic reasons. So one of the tools that we could provide to you, we pass the Senate deal. I, I mean, that I agree with you. But one of the other ones that you have is expedited removal, uh, which is a process that is intended to identify those individuals and families who are truly seeking asylum and to, the, and to quickly remove the rest. Uh, however, as you know, you know it's not where you're in, your men and women are unable to do that uh, because we lack some of the resources. And, uh, uh, and that doesn't give you the options that I wish we had. So what I would ask you, if there's not enough space between CBP and ICE to hold folks through the full duration of the removal proceedings, if you had more asylum officers and processing capacity, uh, would you put more migrants into expedited removal proceedings? And would that help you manage challenges at the border? Thank you, Member Cuellar. Um, we issued a regulation, the asylum officer regulation, that gave greater power to our asylum officers, which enabled us to move more quickly through the asylum adjudication process. One major provision of the Senate bipartisan legislation that would have been so incredibly impactful was to allow us to apply expedited removal proceedings, a much more accelerated removal process to individuals outside of immigration detention. Right now, for single adults, we are restricted to applying expedited removal to those in detention. That bipartisan legislation would have provided us with extraordinary enforcement tools, and I, I remain um, uncertain uh, why it was not unana unanimously uh, approved. I agree with you. Uh, so just to make sure, so you cannot use expedited removal under Title VIII uh, unless if they're detained. That is my understanding of the law to the best of my recollection, Mr. And Ranking we, Member. Yes, sir. And we just don't have that processing space to keep all those folks. Is that correct? Well, as um, Ranking Member Cuellar, as you noted, uh, the number of encounters has dropped significantly over the past uh, several uh, months. Uh, the number of encounters does not in any way equal the number of detention uh, beds that we have. Uh, the 2024 budget, um, I think, funded 41,500 uh, detention beds, and we are encountering uh, approximately 3,800 people in between the ports of entry uh, over the past several weeks, as Mr. Chairman uh, noted. So detention is not the only delivery, uh, consequence delivery uh, that we can issue. What is needed 
is the swift and fast removal of individuals who do not qualify for relief. The bipartisan legislation would have taken a seven-year asylum process, a seven-plus-year asylum process, and reduced it to as little as 90 days. That would have been a game changer. So what, besides the Senate language, which I support, uh, what, besides that, what resources would you need to increase your expedited removal operations uh, uh, to meet the demands that we anticipate? And keep in mind that in between ports, it's 3,800, at least for the last three weeks, 21 days average. Uh, what, what resources would you need, and how would you use that? Ranking Member Cuellar, it is at every stage of the apprehension removal process and everything in between that we would need resources. More Border Patrol agents, more support personnel so we can ensure that those Border Patrol agents are out in the field doing the enforcement work that they signed up and for which they are so skilled to perform. More asylum officers, more immigration and customs enforcement personnel, more detention uh, capacity, more funds for alternatives to detention, more transportation resources, including more resources to be able to, re to execute more removal uh, flights, more legislative authorities so that we can actually fund other countries in enforcing their borders and removing people from their countries before they ever reach the southern border of the United States. And, and I, my time's up, but I do want to emphasize what you said. Uh, expedite removal is only if you have somebody in detention. And if they're out, then we need some changes of the law like the Senate uh, bill does. Thank you so much. You're welcome, Mr. Quayer. Uh, you now recognize Sheriff Ruffin. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Secretary, thank you for being here. I want to go back to a statement that you made in response to the chairman's question about how many people we have deported. You, you said 630,000 have been returned. That is not accurate. The actual ICE deportations is 142,580. All those other people that you're talking about were rejected at the border. Th these are not ICE deportations, and you conflate those two numbers, and, and it's aggravating to me that you do that. Uh, now, and here we are, we've got the same problem that we had a year ago when you were here. In fact, you last testified this, since you last testified before us, 2.4 million people have crossed our southern border. That's more than four years of President Trump's presidency combined. Your immigration policy is in chaos. You don't need Congress to do anything. The president's got the ability to do it. You just need to talk to him to get it done. Now, in fiscal year 23, there were 294 illegal aliens on the terrorist watch list that were arrested between ports of entry. And those are just the ones we caught. How many more are there in the 1.7 million gotaways that we've had over the last three years? Last year, as I mentioned earlier, we deported 142,580 people. But more than that have crossed the border every month for the last 36 months. We have 6.1 million, listen to this number, people, 6.1 million people in the interior of this country on the non-detained docket, almost double what it was in 2020. Of those, uh, roughly 13%, 1.2 million of them have orders for removal, Mr. Secretary. Why haven't you removed those 1.2 million? If, I mean, you said you deported 630,000. No, you didn't. They've exhausted their due process. They've been told they have to get out. They've got orders to leave this country, and you let them stay. Migrants in cities across America are waiting to get an appointment in an ICE office. These are the ones that are on the non-detained list, they're waiting years. And despite all the evidence of this crisis, at every single turn, this administration has undermined our safety and our security. You halted the wall construction. You ended migration pr uh, protection protocols. You've created this mass parole program, and you're making an adequate request for detention space. This administration's failure is making our communities less safe. We have people crossing the border without identification, we don't know who they are. I've talked to you about this before, about the improper vetting that is going on. 
and your default policy seems to be to just let them in. We can't figure out who they are. We don't know who they are for sure because they're not in any database. Come on in. Just a couple years ago in my hometown in Jacksonville, we had a 28-year-old illegal immigrant murder, I'm sorry, he was 23, one of my, murder one of my constituents. CBP encountered him and couldn't confirm who he was or how old he was because he had no identification, but he said he was a juvenile, used a fake name. So under your catch and release policy that you reinstituted after President Trump had ended that, handed him off to HHS, and then uh, it wasn't until after he killed Mr. Cuellar, not this Mr. Cuellar, but hey, hey, Cuellar in Jacksonville, uh, yeah. Uh, that, that we find out who he is. It's Mr. Yoha, and he's now serving 60 years in Florida State Prison. Just last month, we saw another one. Horrible murder because we failed to properly vet an individual, and uh, Lake and Riley was, was murdered by him. Uh, look, I, I want states to work with, I, I want state and local law enforcement to work with ICE. We did in my jurisdiction when I was sheriff in Jacksonville. We had a great 287G program, and that's a fantastic program. And in fact, uh, I'm not the only one that thinks that. Last year, acting director of ICE, Ty Johnson, uh, told this committee that the 287G program, and I'll quote, is the best thing since sliced bread because it acts as a force multiplier. So my question for you very quickly is, do you agree with the director's assessment of the 287G program? And if so, what are you doing to expand it? Um, Congressman, um, the public safety and security of this country is our highest uh, priority. Um, uh, it I doesn't believe, appear so. Um, Congressman, if you'll allow me, uh, I believe that when an individual poses a threat to public safety or national security, a local or state jurisdiction should cooperate with Immigration and Customs Enforcement for the swift detention and removal of that individual. So you didn't answer my question. Do you think 287G program is a good program, and should should will you work with us to expand it? Um, uh, Congressman, uh, I continue to believe that 287G, when executed properly, is a force multiplier for our enforcement efforts. Is that a yes? Uh, uh, as I said, when it is executed properly, it is a force multiplier for our enforcement efforts. You can't get a straight answer on this guy. Uh, it, look. I see my time is up. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you, Sheriff. Uh, Ms. Underwood. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Secretary, it's good to see you again, especially during a busy week. My district stretches across seven counties in northern Illinois outside of Chicago. And as you know, for over a year now, anti-immigrant extremists in southern states have coordinated the deceptive and inhumane busing of migrants arriving at our southern border to blue states like New York or Illinois, including my community. They're using vulnerable people, the vast majority of whom are legally seeking asylum, as pawns in their shameless and shameful political stunt. In contrast, I am so proud to be from Illinois, where under the leadership of our governor, Governor Pritzker, and Mayor Johnson in Chicago, our community has come together to provide resources and support to new, these new arrivals in alignment with our values as Americans. I certainly recognize and appreciate how you and your team have made this issue a priority. But at this point, to speak plainly, Illinois desperately needs more federal support than we're getting. So today, I wanna to talk about our options for the coming months in the current political reality. That means without the Senate supplemental. So just with current DHS authorities and the fiscal year 2024 funding package. Much of the federal funding for communities supporting migrants comes through FEMA's Shelter and Services Protection Program, or SSP. And this funding is largely directed to southern border states. But as these states, like Texas, continue to bust thousands of new arrivals north, it's time to take a look at how we allocate that money. Almost 900 buses with migrants have been sent to Chicagoland in the last 18 months. But just last year, in round one of SSP funding, the state of Texas received 11 of the 34 grants awarded. Illinois received two. In round two, Texas received 33 of the 54 grants awarded, and Illinois received two. For grants awarded with reserve funding, Texas received 28 of the 35 grants awarded. 
Illinois received none. Mr. Secretary, what specific steps is DHS taking to ensure that more fiscal year 2024 funds are directed to communities actually welcoming migrants? Can you commit that Illinois will see a greater share of SSP resources this year? Congresswoman, um, regrettably, the, the 2024 budget uh, includes a reduction in the amount of shelter and services programs funding. We are put in a difficult position of allocating insufficient resources as between cities in the interior of the United States that actually receive um, the individuals who are in immigration enforcement proceedings and the border communities uh, that initially encounter them. We are working through that allocation right now to distribute the 2024 funds, mm -hmm. at least in the first tranche, and allow me to assure you, Congresswoman, that we are working very closely with the jurisdictions both in the interior and at the border to um, uh, increase and maximize the effectiveness of the allocations. Yes, sir. Southern border states will likely always need some dedicated support, but it seems contradictory for a state receiving such a large portion of the funding dedicated to sheltering and providing services for migrants, and then to bus those migrants to other states as soon as they arrive. Furthermore, the total SSP funding and the bipartisan 2024 funding package fell short, as you mentioned, so we need to get creative about more solutions. So what other tools are you thinking about uh, utilizing in order to increase the support it, that DHS could provide to Illinois communities experiencing migrant busing this year? And then can USCIS search personnel to improve processing times for work authorizations, for example, or take any other steps to address those types of delays? And can DHS access any emergency funding or work with other agencies like HHS or DOD to unlock resources? Uh, Congresswoman, um, a few points. First and most uh, fundamentally, it is our hope uh, that uh, public officials will actually coordinate, communicate, and collaborate with other public officials to right. ensure that the interests of the nation are properly served and that chaos is not deliberately sowed. Number one. Uh, number two, we have deployed teams to some of the interior cities to ensure uh, that our expertise in the processing of individuals and understanding their eligibility for certain benefits is fully realized. And we have dispatched a team to Chicago, Illinois for that purpose. So we are working very closely across the administration and with the cities to address the challenges before us. And with those teams, do they include, again, personnel across the interagency, including USCIS, to be able to increase processing, you know, to access funds from other departments, et cetera? If not, please consider taking those steps as we move forward, particularly in this moment where we have to use more creative strategies because, as you know, sir, hope is not a solution and it's certainly not a policy. And we know that uh, some of these extremists in the southern states are not going to change their behavior, particularly as we approach the fall. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you. Uh, we now recognize Ms. Stinson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, thank you, Ranking Member Cuellar, for holding this hearing today. Uh, Mr. Secretary, thank you for appearing before us. Um, you state in your testimony that the President's budget request prioritizes staying ahead of diverse and complex threats facing the homeland and highlights your, quote, unwavering dedication to protecting the security of the American people. And the President's budget also states that strengthening border security and providing safe and law lawful pathways for migration remain top priorities for the administration. Um, I want to build on something one of my colleagues asked, uh, Mr. Secretary, how many gotaways have there been since President Biden took office? Um, Congresswoman, I will provide that data to you. I don't have the you number. You said it, 1.7 million gotaways. So uh, you and the Biden administration over the past few years have reversed the secure policies that were working. You stopped the border wall construction, expanded parole, allowed for millions of individuals, as we've heard, including known inspected terrorists, cartel members, unforgivable levels of fentanyl and illicit drugs and substances into our country. These 1.7 million individuals came into our country in neither a safe nor lawful way, yet again you sit before this committee and ask for out of touch priorities again and refuse to take accountability for the total failure that you have allowed for at the southern border. So again, I want to build on something one of my colleagues said, why would you raise, uh, when we raise the detention bed capacity for ICE to 41,500, would you request bringing that number down to 34,000? Congresswoman, um, uh, my answer is twofold. Uh, number one, uh, of course, the 2024 budget and the 41,500 beds allocated uh, to us um, uh, postdated 
uh, our submission of the fiscal year 2025 budget where we remain at 34,000 beds. We will, of course, work with this committee uh, and the Senate Appropriations Committee uh, to ensure that the 41,500 bed capacity is sustained in the year ahead. And this I is about deterrence. This is about border deterrence, and what we want to see happen is a, a proper accountability and oversight of that deterrence. $4.7 billion you've uh, got for the Southwest Border Contingency Fund, which we know is a slush fund that you have access to because you came before the committee last year uh, asking for that same out-of-touch priority. So um, I think you've really disrespected hardworking taxpayers, again, through these processes, attempting to get this slush fund in place to circumvent congressional direction. Uh, I think that's appalling. That's what I hear from Iowans. The purpose of the slush fund is stated to be around the uncertainty surrounding border conditions in any given year for surge-related functions. But uh, you've systematically wasted taxpayer dollars already. You've opened the door for these surge-related activities, waving the green light for all these migrants to come, cartels, the human drug traffickers. Um, there is no excuse to call for billions of dollars of additional slush fund dollars when it is clear that your leadership and decision-making is so off the mark here. And I think it's very concerning and alarming uh, for a secretary that is instilled to protect our homeland to, um, to compromise on this. Um, in your testimony, you did state, I am eager to work with Congress to deliver for the American people and the men and women who protect our homeland. Um, but you're pointing the finger at Congress to fix um, the very decisions that the administration has made that have led to this crisis, correct? No, that is incorrect. Why do um, you think that's incorrect? Actually, actually pointing uh, to Congress to fix what everyone agrees is a broken immigration system. Congresswoman, you... You, you mentioned the 41,500 detention beds uh, that are funded in fiscal year 2024. That is less than the bipartisan Senate bill would have provided. The, si the bipartisan Senate bill would have provided 50,000 detention The Senate bill beds. also allows the president way too much authority in terms of um, circumventing all of the legal processes that we do have in place. Um, and we've seen emergency requests for, uh, obviously, the crisis that uh, you and the Biden administration have created purposefully and systematically. Um, I don't think that's a good argument. Um, you've reversed, again, countless policies uh, that were in place that were working to keep our southwest border under control, opening flood walls for this security um, uh, crisis at our southern border. Again, unprecedented levels of illicit drugs and deadly fentanyl. Um, you speak of a consequence regime, Mr. Secretary. Um, my constituents are feeling the consequence of this regime every single day. Um, pounds of drugs instead of ounces in my district. Increased crime. Uh, we are seeing a complete overwhelming number of illegal immigrant children in our district, overwhelming Iowa classrooms and teachers every single day. Um, you can try to hide from the American public at how we got to this point. You can point fingers at Congress for fixing systems, but Mr. Secretary, we've seen gamesmanship out of the administration um, and gimmicks. And I, I called for your resignation last year, and I stand by my request, um, and I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Uh, we now recognize uh, Congressman Case. Thank you, Mr. Chair, Mr. Secretary. <clears throat> it's been a little over eight months since the incredibly tragic Maui wildfires, some of the worst in our country's history. And um, I want to start by thanking um, the Department of Homeland Security, the Federal Emergency Management um, Agency, FEMA, uh, you personally, uh, as well as Administrator Criswell, Mr. Fenton, and your entire team for the response uh, on Maui, which has been a tremendous response uh, we have uh, certainly felt uh, that you have been full partners uh, in this recovery. Uh, I have Mayor Bisson actually from Maui in the room here, and uh, he wanted me to express his personal appreciation to you as well. Uh, you've been in touch with him personally. You've met with him. You've stayed in touch. And so thank you for your, your response. Um, also to this subcommittee, including Mr. Joyce here, uh, who visited personally himself uh, to uh, find out what was going on, and uh, this committee and subcommittee responded by, in part by plussing up our disaster relief fund, which needed to be done in our last supplemental, as well as the actions in the FY 2024 uh, bill. Um, aside from, uh, I think, many uh, positive areas of progress, uh, the one that is the missing piece is housing, as you well know. Um, the history here is that the fires uh, displaced about 12,000 people. Um, 4,000 of them went into some other form of housing, uh, very unsatisfactory right away, and 8,000 went into hotel rooms themselves. Of that 8,000, um, we have um, uh, still today about 2,800 individuals, about 1,100 families. Um, they clearly don't want to be in those hotels anymore, and neither does FEMA. We want to move them out of those hotels. Um, and yet, um, the very uh, unique circumstances of the Maui housing market make it very difficult for you to follow your kind of standard approach. 
Uh, FEMA has made choices in the past between rehousing and rebuilding. You've chosen rehousing on, on Maui, um, and I understand that, uh, but that's not going to be all of the solution here. You actually do need some form of rebuilding to pull this off over time. Um, it's not going to really do the job. The federal um, delegation, the Hawaii delegation, uh, the state of Hawaii, uh, Mr. Bisson and the county of all asked FEMA uh, to come off of the rehousing I exclusively uh, solution here uh, and instead move to the actual construction of um, at least some temporary transitional housing on land that the state of Hawaii is making available to you to do that either the actual housing itself, which would be transitional, or at least the infrastructure for that housing so that other people can take care of it and put in about 1,000 uh, units that are desperately needed to cover a gap in the housing availability. And that gap is caused not only by the shortage of housing on Maui in general, but by the fact that there are many uh, people that are, are being housed in hotels and otherwise that are not eligible uh, for FEMA housing right now. They've been disqualified for many reasons. And so um, there's, there's two solutions here. The, the rehousing exclusively is not going to work. Uh, the rebuilding has to happen in some way, shape, or form. Um, some combination of rebuilding transition, transitional housing and or the exercise of your waiver authority to allow the people that are being disqualified from rehousing uh, to actually uh, get into that rehousing market. I think this would be good all around. You certainly are spending a heck of a lot of money that you don't need to be spending um, on some of these housing options that you've pursued in a, again, a very tight market. So what can you, you know, tell us about your thoughts in terms of uh, the Maui wildfire overall? And again, I say this in the context of sincere appreciation for your efforts. Congressman, thank you very much for recognizing the extraordinary work of FEMA uh, in close partnership with state and local um, officials. Uh, uh, you correctly described the housing challenge following the tragic fires as extremely complex and difficult, and we are looking at all our options and also are eager to work uh, with Congress to assess what additional authorities FEMA might need. We're working across the administration, not just uh, the Department of Homeland Security through FEMA, but also with housing and urban development, with economic experts to understand what uh, is the right solution for the people of Maui, whether rehousing is inadequate and therefore we have to rebuild the challenges of rebuilding are, are difficult because of its island status, its unique um, uh, uh, situation as an extraordinary tourist destination. The price, the, the pricing of housing is different than many other. Uh, yeah, I, I appreciate that, Mr. Secretary. I'm sorry, my time's uh, almost up, so apologies for interrupting you. I commend you on all of those efforts, but we don't have time. Um, the answers are, are pretty straightforward. You're never going to be able to satisfy, satisfy this on a strict rehousing approach. Um, there's not enough housing in the, in the overall market. Um, you can't leave people in hotel rooms for another six months to a year while you figure this out with the economic experts. Um, some decision needs to be made on some form of rebuilding and or the waiver authority that will relieve the pressure on that rebuilding. So I commend that to you. We'll follow up with you personally. But again, thank you very much for your efforts and we'll, we'll stay in touch. Thank you, I look forward to it. Thank you. Thank you, sir. We now recognize the uh, gentleman, Mr. Cloud. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm gonna start with a very simple question. What's the name of your department that you are the secretary of? It's the department What is of, the, na the name of the department? The department, yes. The Department of Homeland Security. The Department of Homeland Security. And your department was stood up when 19 foreign nationals misrepresented who they were and used our infrastructure and our resources to bring a, a catastrophic attack, of course, on September 11th. Now, your department is tasked with protecting the homeland, uh, and you have done more to turn it into and to prioritize processing than you have protection. When you talk to the Border Patrol agents in Texas who are doing a yeoman's work, doing everything they can with what they are being faced with. They are very frustrated that they have been taken off their job of protecting our borders and have instead been put in the role of processing. Could you speak to any authorities that Congress has removed from you or the president since taking office? Um, uh, Congressman, um, ha you has mentioned- Has Congress you removed any authorities from you or the president since you've taken office? Congressman, the, uh, the point- That's a yes or no question. 
Congressman, the point that you make with respect to Border Patrol agents is exactly why. You're, you're filibustering. I asked you a yes or no question. Congressman, the point Has that you make. Has Congress exactly removed any authorities from you or the president since you've taken office? Congressman, the point that you make with respect to Border the Patrol agents. The answer is agent. no. I'd also make uh, the point that you have approximately 20 percent larger budget than Trump had. Uh, the president has made the point that he can't secure the border. He can't get down to he because he is waiting on Congress to move. And I just point that out to belay that and point out the truth of the fact that he has every single authority as President Trump. He has more resources at his disposal than President Trump. Yet he has done everything he can to undermine the security of our border. Have you read the book Unrestricted Warfare or the pamphlet? Congressman, uh, what is your? Uh, it, it was it was a report that was written by two colonels uh, in the Chinese Army. Uh, Congressman, what is your substantive question about uh, the, the work the, of the Department of Homeland Security? The the question is so is that a yes or no? No. Uh, in in the the pamphlet or the brochure, it's a couple hundred pages long. It talks about the fact that a country would be to to take out the United States. You would not try to use kinetic warfare. You would use things like abusing our legal system, attacks on our infrastructure, terrorism, smuggling warfare, drug warfare, economic aid warfare. In other words, getting us to overuse and to what the way we, we beat the Soviet Union was getting them to overspend. It was economic collapse because we, we got in an arms race with them and they couldn't keep up economically. Right now we are wasting and spending money uh, in ways because uh, – uh, uh, and it's it's leading to our demise right now. The number one threat against our country is our our fiscal uh, house. Um, do you have any concerns that China may be engaged with unrestricted warfare in our country, Congressman? Um, uh, addressing uh, the challenges that the People's Republic of China poses is one of our highest priorities, and we have a number of lines of effort to address that. Whether that is enforcement of the Weaker Forced Labor Protection Act. How, how many Chinese fight, nationals have crossed our border in the and, last couple of years? And the, and the fight against uh, forced labor, whether that is battling. That's not other, homeland security. I, I, I appreciate that, but that's not homeland security. Um, we are tasked with enforcement of the UFLPA, Congressman. Secondly, I'm asking fighting, you about the border. How many Chinese nationals have crossed our border? I, I'd be pleased to provide that data. It's uh, tens of you. thousands. It's. Uh, the second, secondly, the thousands. secondly, the the threat of cyber attacks. Right now, right now, crossing our border are tens of thousands of Chinese nationals who are not presently in our country. They are primarily single-aged adult male, military-aged, uh, and they've crossed our border. And uh, you are not doing anything to counteract that. Um, you mentioned expanding lawful pathways. Who makes laws? Congressman. Um, if you must ask me questions, the answers to which you know, uh, allow me to answer it. Congress. Thank you. You haven't answered the other questions, so I'll just point that out. Uh, the issue that we have when it comes to analyzing your budget, and this has been the difficult part, is, is we look at our budgets and we want to spend money to secure our border. And so we, as Congress, write the check for security, and then you get it and you turn it into processing. Uh, and you turn it into basically human trafficking and aiding and abetting cartels and all the nefarious action that's happened. So we've had 100,000 people killed from fentanyl, the precursors coming from China. That's about 300 people. That would be like a plane with 300 people a day dying in our country. And that, well, now we have cells within our country who at any moment could strike our infrastructure or the other ways of unrestricted warfare that I, I've mentioned. I would urge you to get a focus on homeland security be focused on protection. Let's stop the funding for the, the, the unnecessary processing. Let's secure our border and put back in place the, uh, the policies that had led to a secure or almost secure border. Thank you. I yield back. Thank you, sir. We now recognize the ranking member of the entire committee, uh, Ms. Delora. Thank you very, very much, Mr. Chairman, and I'm sorry to be running in and out, but the nature of the beast, so thank you. Thank you very much. And Mr. Secretary, thank you very, very much. Thank you for your uh, years of service to this country. I said in the prior meeting, I said to Secretary Cardona, uh, it was Shirley Chisholm, the uh, 
uh, the first African-American woman to sit in this body that uh, said that public service is the rent we pay uh, for space on this earth. And uh, as I said to Secretary Cardona, who has been paying the rent, you have been paying that rent over and over again. So thank you so much for being here. I have a couple of FEMA questions, if I can. Uh, FEMA Initiative is the nonprofit security grant program. Uh, funding to not-for-profit uh, organizations making physical security improvements to facilities at the high risk of terrorist attack. Uh, particularly for years in the aftermath of conflict in Gaza, uh, I've been concerned, others are concerned about threats to temples, mosques, churches, other places of worship. Uh, glad to see the program prioritized and supplemental funding requests received from the administration last fall. Though I do regret the program received um, a cut as part of very difficult negotiations over the Homeland Bill just a few weeks ago. Uh, a, a couple of questions here. Has the department assessed an increase in threats against places of worship in the aftermath of October 7th? What other types of nonprofit facilities are facing acute threats of violence and could be served by this program? Can you speak briefly to the 2025 request level for the program, 110 $0.5 million increase above 24 funding and what that request would support in terms of meeting that need. Congresswoman, the heightened threat environment in which we uh, currently live has only been exacerbated um, by the October 7th uh, terrorist attacks uh, against the state uh, of Israel. We have seen a dramatic increase in the rise in anti-Semitism as well as Islamophobia. Mm -hmm. The nonprofit security grant a program provides much needed dollars to places of worship and other nonprofit organizations, such as synagogues, uh, religious day schools, mosques. Mm -hmm. And that is precisely why our fiscal year 25 budget request sees an augmentation of that grant program funding. Mm -hmm. And uh, 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 would that allow additional grants to these, 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 these facilities in order for security and protection? It would. And, and uh, tragically, what we see is increasingly target-rich and resource-poor uh, institutions, mm -hmm. and the increase in funding would allow us to ensure enfranchisement in our grant programs, a better inclusivity uh, to build right. capacity where it does not currently mm -hmm. exist. Mm -hmm. But we are working very closely with different communities, different faith communities, different nonprofit organizations, to share best practices and do what we can with the limited funds available to us. Mm -hmm. It's a very, it's critically important in, in my community. I hear from uh, these organizations all of the time, many small organizations, but nevertheless under serious threat continuously. Let me move on to another FEMA question if I can, and I'll try to be quick, Mr. Mr. Chairman. Um, um, uh, uh, and FEMA, by the way, is the single largest part of the Homeland budget, as I understand it. It plays a, an expansive role in keeping our community safe. Um, uh, it, 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 it's uh, firefighters, next generation warning system, preventing violence and terrorism, talking about protecting our homeland, homeland security, responding to disasters, helping communities recover, build back stronger. Uh, we've got uh, extreme weather events, wildfires, hurricanes, winter storms, threaten the infrastructure that we rely on every day. Let me talk about Connecticut across New England, historic flooding. These events put people's livelihoods and their lives really at risk and create public health and public safety crisis. Let me, I'd like to focus on prevention and pre-disaster mitigation. The sad reality is disasters are going to happen. So can we speak to the 2025 request for FEMA? How you envision it should be focused on preparedness, protection, and mitigation, uh, where, where are increased investments needed in order for you to, su to support this work? What kind of policy changes sh should the Congress be considering? Because yes, indeed, it's about homeland security. These are homeland security issues. Congresswoman, I, I look forward to working with you on assessing what legislative changes are needed to better address the increasing impacts of climate change, the increasing frequency and gravity of extreme weather events, I have spoken with mayors around the country about the need to update building codes, something as, as okay. you know, mm -hmm. basic as that, because the building codes are addressing the weather of yesterday and not the weather of today or tomorrow. Mm -hmm. I, I believe it is Colorado, Colorado State University that just issued a report about its prediction 
uh, for hurricane season, and um, it is really looking very, very troubling. Um, an ounce of prevention today is absolutely vital uh, to preventing uh, calamities in local communities across this country. The, the, the situation is getting worse from an extreme weather perspective, and we have to work with every community to ensure it understands what it needs to do uh, with the funds that we distribute to it and the funds that they themselves have in terms of understanding how houses and residences of all types need to be prepared, need to be safeguarded, and what people need to do should an extreme weather event actually occur. Mm -hmm. I, I thank you, and I thank the chair. I just said, make this final comment. I would very, very much like to work with you on this because I think the whole issue of FEMA and its role in national and homeland security gets lost. It gets lost in a whole lot of, um, uh, yes, serious issues, but a whole lot of political rhetoric as well. But this is, uh, I, I think, an area where Congress may have the opportunity uh, to do something and to do something in a bipartisan basis because these kinds of conditions uh, affect all of our communities. And I thank you. I thank you for your indulgence, Mr. Chairman. You're welcome, Mr. DeLauro. <clears throat> we now recognize Congressman Newhouse. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Ranking Member, Mr. Secretary. Thanks for being with us this morning. Appreciate that very much. I want to discuss the fentanyl crisis uh, that we all know is raging throughout our country. You know, fentanyl uh, floods across the southwest border. Uh, doesn't stay in border communities, however. Uh, it spreads throughout the country, and it's destroying lives, it's destroying families, it's destroying communities throughout the United States. Um, in your testimony, you note that the department has stopped more illicit fentanyl and, and arrested more individuals for fentanyl-related crimes in the last two fiscal years than in the previous five years combined. And while this is admirable, it's equally disturbing. Uh, the men and women of uh, CBP and ICE uh, do extraordinary work on the front line and beyond uh, to execute their mission of protecting the homeland, and we all appreciate that. However, as Border Patrol agents are pulled off the front line to, to process and then release the majority of illegal migrants into the United States, Cartels, being very clever, they've shifted their tactics to exploit the vulnerabilities that those personnel uh, shifts and shortfalls have created. In your testimony, you also note that in fiscal year 25, the budget request includes critical investments in the fight against fentanyl, specifically the non-intrusive inspection technology, and you mentioned that in your verbal testimony. Yet when I reviewed the bu budget justifications for that program, it says that the FY25 budget does not provide procurement funding for this investment, although it does request level funding for operations and support. I didn't see the roughly $300 million that purportedly is necessary to install the scanners used to detect drugs and other contraband that have been purchased and are sitting in a warehouse that are literally collecting dust as you and I are sitting here in this hearing room. Uh, this is something that just totally frustrates and, and concerns me. When I visited the border in Arizona just this last February, one of your, our own Border Patrol agents, in answer to my question, told me this directly. We do not control the border. The cartels control the border. The cartels determine who, when, and where people cross our border. Even more concerning, a local resident told me that him and his neighbors don't even lock their doors anymore because smugglers, illegal migrants, they come through the area, break into homes, take whatever they want, they steal the clothing, they steal food. People have, have resorted to just leaving stuff out on their patios and leaving their doors unlocked to try to prevent the damage of people breaking in. I, I think that's just, to have fellow, fellow citizens going through that on a daily basis to me is unconscionable. This, this federal fentanyl epidemic, it, it's fueled through the Southwest border. Over 50% comes through Arizona alone. How can, better yet, how, why uh, can the department justify this? Tell me, are you working with Mexican authorities to do 
what I see, two important things. Stop fentanyl precursors from coming from Mexico. And number two, prevent waves of migrants from physically rushing the border. What are, the, what, what are some of the specific and tangible actions? Uh, Congressman, I'll, I'll answer very briefly in the limited time we have, but I would welcome the opportunity to speak with you outside of this hearing to, to talk about the work that we to talk about the work that we are doing with Mexico, both in the fight against fentanyl and to ensure that uh, individuals who seek to arrive at our border are interdicted before they reach our border. But we are working very closely with Mexico and not only with Mexico to interdict the flow of precursor chemicals as well as the pill presses and other equipment used to manufacture fentanyl into this hemisphere. And I will share with you, I share your concern Congressman Newhouse, because for 12 years I was a federal prosecutor battling the trafficking in substances as serious as cocaine and black tar heroin, and we've seen nothing like the toxicity and fatality of fentanyl, and we have to battle it together. And this is a scourge that has been growing for years. I believe it was in 2020 that there were 57,000 overdose deaths. This is not a new phenomenon. It is a years-long phenomenon, and we need to work together to address it. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll yield back. Thank you, <clears throat> Mr. Newhouse. Uh, we now recognize uh, Mr. Guest. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Secretary, uh, the discretionary budget this year is $62.2 billion. Is that correct? I believe that's I believe that's correct. And the request last year was sixty point four billion as it relates to discretionary spending. Is that correct? I believe so, Congressman. Uh, you said it in your opening statement that there was an insufficient budget, that we were not giving you the funds necessary for you to be able to carry out your job uh, and the men and women who serve under you. Last year you requested sixty four sixty point four billion dollars and Congress appropriated sixty one point eight billion dollars. So we actually appropriated more money than you asked for. When you look at what you're asking for this year versus what we appropriated last year, those numbers are very similar. There is not a huge discrepancy between 62.2 and 61.8 billion dollars. And as I look through the individual items that you requested, uh, one of the things that Ms. Henson brought up were detention beds. Uh, Congress this year funded 41,500 detention beds but yet you're only requesting 34,000 detention beds. And you also referenced the Senate bill. In the Senate bill, you said the Senate bill, uh, which never passed out of the Senate, but was a bill on which they were debating as part of the uh, overall funding package, you said would have funded 50,000 detention beds. And I'm assuming you supported the Senate bill, did you not? Oh, I, I, I hope uh, you, you would have as well. Well, if it would have come over here, I would have been happy to have looked at it, but it, uh, unfortunately, it never made it out of the Senate, so the House did not have a chance to review the legislation. Uh, so do you support, then, the 50,000 detention beds that would have been in the Senate bill? In the context of the bipartisan Senate bill, yes. All right, but yet you're asking for some 16,000 less detention beds and actually 7,500 less detention beds than we currently fund. And you talk about expedited re removal, and you say that people who are in detention often have expedited removal. And so if the intent is to those individuals who don't need to be here to remove them from the country sooner rather than later, and we know about the immigration courts and the backlog and all the uh, problems that, that we face, putting people in detention expedites their removal from the country generally, does it not? Uh, Congressman, a, a few things. Number one, remember that when we fund detention beds, we also have to fund personnel. Um, uh, it is part do, of a. Part, do you, do you need more of, money for personnel? I, I want to know what you need to fund more detention beds because uh, to me it seems asinine, Mr. Secretary, that we're going to ask for less detention beds when we see a record surge in immigration, when we see a record number of orders of removal that have been issued by the court, but yet we're saying that we don't need detention beds if we're going to one, prevent people from coming into the country, or if we're not going to prevent them once they're here and once there is a final disposition of their case, if we're going to seek to remove them. Okay. And, and, and I'm, I'm very concerned about that fact. I'm very concerned that you're asking not only for less than we funded this year, but you're asking for substantially less than the Senate bill, which you said that you, that you agreed with. 
Congressman, a few points. Uh, number one, as I articulated uh, earlier, our fiscal year 25 budget request was submitted uh, before uh, Congress uh, passed uh, the fiscal year 2024 budget. Uh, what number, what number do you need? Num is number 34,000, is that the number that you need right now? Uh, we are committed to working with Congress to sustain the 41,500 beds that well, Congress if, if, funded. Well, if, if that's the number, why didn't you put that in your budget? Why, why are you substantially underselling the number of detention beds and then making Congress come in and bump those numbers up? If those are the numbers you need, if those are the appropriate numbers, Mr. Secretary, I would ask that you put those numbers actually in your budget and that you ask Congress to fund that and that you don't, add, and that you don't, don't expect us that we're just going to plus up those numbers and so you leave those numbers artificially low. Now, one last thing, and I know my time is running short, so in an effort to make sure that I save uh, time for other members, uh, Fox News is reporting uh, that there is going to be a possible executive order uh, issued by the president. Uh, this says to shut down the border by the end of the month. Are you aware, are you in any discussions with the president uh, about executive orders that would relate to border security and or immigration? Uh, Congressman, we are consistently evaluating what options are available uh, to us. Uh, we do that uh, on a regular basis. I will share with you that executive action, uh, which is um, inevitably challenged in the courts, um, is no substitute for enduring do, solution, do you, if I may, uh, for in the enduring solution of legislation uh, that will fix what everyone agrees is a broken immigration system. And as a secretary, do you believe that the president has the power to issue executive orders uh, that would uh, deal with border security uh, and or immigration? We, we have actually um, uh, implemented executive orders by way of uh, very critical and effective uh, regulations, and I would be pleased to speak with you about those. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Thank you, sir. We now recognize Dr. Harris. Thank you very much. And, and first at the top, uh, I want to make sure that you convey my thanks to the Coast Guard for what they're doing in the Port of Baltimore. Uh, their response was... Tremendous. I mean, that getting that port reopened is important. Obviously, it's a multi-agency effort. Coast Guard uh, uh, is playing a very important role as well as the Army Corps of Engineers, so I want to convey my thanks. Thank you, Congressman. Now, I will do so. Um, I'm going to ask you a question that has come, come up because, uh, you know, the FBI director has testified before Congress that he wasn't certain whether or not there were undercover operatives, FBI operatives, uh, working on January 6th in the crowd. Uh, but an undercover journalist with Sound Investigations released a video you may be aware of in the last two days of a CIA official, former FBI member, actually saying, yes, there were. So I'm going to ask you a simple question. Were there undercover officers or agents from the Department of Homeland Security or paid informants in the crowd on January 6th? Uh, Congressman, I don't know the answer to that question. I will follow up with you. Wow is all I can say. Was Ray Epps a paid informant? Congressman, I'm not familiar with those facts. I'd be very pleased um, to get them uh, to you. Thank you very much. And, and is, it, is it the policy of the Department of Homeland Security, uh, because I understand it is the policy of the FBI to actually have undercover individuals at these events to kind of keep them in control, to allow people to, to peacefully exert their, their First Amendment rights while kind of, you know, calling attention to people who might interfere with that. So is it the policy of uh, the Department of Homeland Security to have undercover agents or officers or paid informants at events like that? Events like? Like a large protest somewhere uh, where people attempt to exert their First Amendment rights. Congressman, that is not where we focus our Okay, undercover. but if you get uh, the answers I, to me on the other one, I'd appreciate that about January 6th, uh, whether or not you, you had uh, agents there. Okay. Let me talk a little bit about uh, the OIG. The OIG has uh, complained that they attempt to get things from the Department of Homeland Security. I'm going to ask this letter to, uh, say, to Chairman Green from January 17th from the OIG to be entered into the record, where she points out that the department over the past few years has used uh, the excuse of the Privacy Act and the Presidential Records Act to withhold information from the OIG. Now, the purpose of the OIG, as you know, is, is Congress uh, we think the OIGs are important to keep an eye on, on the individual departments, and we would hope that the departments would always cooperate with their OIGs because otherwise it looks a little suspicious. So do you agree that the Privacy Act and the Presidential Records Act, in fact, do not affect the ability of the department to transfer information to the OIG? Congressman, let me assure you that we cooperate fully with the Office of Inspector General, and we also 
appreciate the importance it, of the inspector generals in making sure our department is as efficient and effective as it can be. Is, is your inspector general Joseph Kafari? Yes, he is. But in this letter, he says you're not cooperating. And I I'll enter in, Mr. Chairman, I, without objection, I'd like that entered into the record. Congressman, I, uh, I respectfully uh, disagree with the inspector general. <laughs> well, that's why we have inspector generals to actually keep an eye on the departments. And we expect when the department is doing something that they want to cover up, that they're not going to cooperate with the inspector general. And then they're going to claim that they cooperate with the inspector general. Uh, well, that's our cop on the beat. That's our cop on the beat watching the cops on the beat. Okay. Uh, Congressman, so, um, um, assuredly, um, um, you are speaking of a department different than ours when you characterize that type of behavior. That's not what the letter kind of indicates. Anyway, the last thing I want to talk about in the last remaining minute is the effect of offshore wind on search and rescue uh, missions for the Coast Guard, because this is an issue. In, we have an active uh, uh, port in Ocean City. We have a lot of commercial fishermen and private people who are worried that when they construct these huge wind, offshore windmills uh, off the coast of Maryland, that in fact Coast Guard search and rescue operations will be harmed. So I'm going to ask to enter into the record a U.S. Naval Institute study on offshore wind energy, a rising challenge to Coast Guard operations that indicates uh, the, the potential effects of these on search and rescue missions, clearly an important part of what the Coast Guard does, and clearly some, you know, preserving life and limb uh, in, in the maritime uh, environment should be the first, one of the first things the government does before it expends huge amounts of money on, uh, on offshore wind, a very expensive source of energy, but that's a discussion for a different agency. Uh, I also want to uh, ask if you could follow up with the Coast Guard. Uh, there's a November uh, 25, 2019 letter, which again I'll, be, I'll ask to be entered into the record, uh, signed by the Director Jennifer William, Captain Jennifer William, Director of Marine Transportation System, Acting U.S. Coast Guards, where she suggests that, un that ongoing studies are done, are being done, this is now five years ago, four and a half years ago, with regards to the safety of, uh, of offshore wind vis-a-vis search and rescue missions of the Coast Guard. Are you aware whether or not the, the, that determination has been made, whether it's been safe? I'd be pleased to follow up with you, Congressman. Thank you very much. And again, I ask uh, that be entered into the record. Any yield back? Uh, the objection and all exhibits are admitted uh, without objection. <clears throat> uh, would the members desire to proceed with the second round, three minutes? Okay. Recognizing myself. Uh, Congress provided more than $5.8 billion to the border wall but your agency continues to waste money appropriated in FY 2020 and 2021 explicitly for barrier construction on everything but the actual construction of the wall. This administration finally admitted that the FY 2019 funds were not spent on the wall as Congress intended, they would be breaking the law. As a result of the lawsuit, you can no longer waste additional money on make safe projects and other non-wall construction. Why won't this administration follow the clear and unambiguous intent of Congress and build additional miles of wall with the roughly $600 million left in the wall account? Uh, Mr. Chairman, um, I, I won't speak to the uh, Texas uh, court decision because that is um, a matter of ongoing lit litigation, but let me assure you uh, that we do comply with the law. As a matter of fact, uh, because uh, of our understanding of the uh, legal imperative, uh, we approved uh, the construction of 17 miles of wall. We did that last year. In addition, I have approved, I believe it is 129, I may have the exact number um, uh, inaccurately, but I believe I am right, 129 uh, gates and, ga uh, gaps, uh, gates and gap uh, closures uh, and reforms. And so we are complying uh, with the law, but we continue to believe uh, that technology is a far more advanced um, capability that we need uh, to invest in to ensure the security of our border. On my trips to the uh, border, sir, I've seen wall parts stacked, not being constructed. So I'm wondering just how much money it costs the department to cancel those contracts midstream when taking into account additional work that needs to be done, such as stabilizing roads, drainage, and other mitigation efforts. Uh, Congressman, uh, Mr. Chairman, forgive me, uh, Mr. Chairman. Fair um, enough. Um, please to provide you with the figures you've requested. Uh, thank you. Now recognize the distinguished ranking member, Mr. Quayle. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, you, you've been to Texas. You've seen the border wall, the levee wall, so we have up there. 
When somebody's asking for asylum, don't they all have to do is just touch the riverbank? Uh, once they um, they step on United States soil, ranking member the Cuellar, uh, they have um, a lawful right to claim asylum. And since we have a 1,200 mile uh, river, uh, the fences that we have are not in the middle of the river, which is really the international boundary. They're not at the river banks, but they're actually a quarter of a mile or even longer away, correct? Uh, in certain places, that is indeed correct. Okay, thank you. Uh, le let me ask you, uh, according to uh, the numbers that I've seen from, from you all, most of the drugs that we have coming in are coming through ports of entry. Uh, meth, cocaine, fentanyl, up to 94% are coming through ports of entry. Is that correct? With respect to the southern border, yes, that is correct. Um, I believe it is um, our data, our intelligence and analysis demonstrate that approximately 90%, if not more, of the drugs entering the country through the border um, arrive through, are smuggled in through the ports of entry. So I certainly ask you that whatever monies that we added for technology, the non-intrusive, move on that uh, as much as possible so we can have them not only at the ports of entry, but also in the Border Patrol checkpoints also. I would ask you to move those as soon as possible. Uh, and according to the U.S. Sentencing Commission, 86 to 87 percent of the people are, are, are smuggling drugs uh, at the ports of entry or at the checkpoints are U.S. citizens, correct? Um, I'm not certain about the precise percentage, but, but I do understand that the data evidences that the majority are United States citizens. The last numbers I saw were about 86, 87 percent U.S. citizens. Now, let me go back to, I, I'm a big believer in uh, expedited, Title VIII expedited. What resources, I'll ask you again, uh, like more asylum officers, uh, space, do you need so we can do expedited removals? Um, under we, Title VIII. Um, Ranking Member Quare, in addition to um, additional legal authority, which we would have been provided under the bipartisan legislation, um, many more asylum officers, um, immigration, uh, I'm sorry, uh, enforcement and removal officers in immigration and customs enforcement, additional personnel, additional um, customs and border protection uh, personnel, additional facilities, uh, and um, those are some of the, the highlights with respect to what we need, but underlying it is the additional legal authority that the bipartisan uh, legislation would have delivered. And we certainly want to provide to the funding. I, I, again, I, I just have to say this, Mr. Chairman. Uh, the two last uh, appropriation bills where we added $1.4 billion to CBP, uh, every single person on the other side of the aisle except for two that are still in Congress, voted no for that extra money. Uh, this last appropriations bill where we added the largest amount to CBP, uh, I think less than uh, half of the majority, majority voted for funding. So we gotta make sure that we all work together to do bipartisan funding to give you this. Now the last question on, on expedited removal, again, I believe in expedited removal, Title VIII, it was used very effectively when you were with the Obama administration under Secretary Jay Johnson. You said that the only way we can use CBP uh, removal or Title VIII if they're under CBP title, uh, custody. Would a monitoring system still be under CBP? And I guess you can't answer that, but I want you to think about it and go back to your attorneys to see if you can use uh, Title VIII expedited removal uh, because custody means probably under, you know, ICE or CBP facility, but we do use monitoring, and I would ask you to see if you can look at that, whether that would be custody, which I, my opinion, I, I would say yes, and see if you can use Title VIII uh, expedited removal. Um, and, and again, anything that we can change the law, uh, and I don't know what y'all are looking at, uh, the uh, executive order, but we do know that at the very beginning, a lot of those people don't qualify. They do not qualify, with all due respect. If they're hungry, uh, they want a job, they want to come to the U.S. or the Chinese city on top of the hill, I understand that, but they don't qualify under the five persecution uh, under asylum law. So we want to work with you, we want to support them, and, and again, you have a very difficult job. There are so many opinions here. Uh, you 
or you get attacked if, because you do too much or you get attacked for not doing enough. But I do want to say I want to thank you for your service, and I want to thank uh, the men and women that work on your department. Thank you. Thank you very much. God bless. Mr. Thank you, Mr. Cuellar. We now recognize uh, Mrs. Henson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Mr. Secretary, last year uh, when you came before this subcommittee, uh, I did ask you about concerning reports of Chinese nationals uh, crossing our open border. Um, I brought this concern to you directly, Mr. Secretary, because uh, President Biden did not do anything to prevent this issue. It has become worse. Um, and now Chinese nationals, um, as you may be aware, are the largest and fastest growing group uh, attempting to cross into our country. Um, but I am um, concerned that your testimony in your budget does uh, not uh, acknowledge that fact or directly do anything to address it. Is that correct? Oh, uh, Congresswoman, let me be clear. Number one, um, any individual who poses a threat to public safety or national security is a priority for detention, number one. Number two, uh, for the first time, I had an engagement with my counterpart from the People's Republic of China to ensure that China would begin to accept removal flights so that we can deliver a consequence regime for individuals from the People's Republic of China who do not have a legal basis to remain. What was the remain, outcome of that conversation? Uh, who do not have a legal basis to remain in the United States, and those discussions are ongoing, and we actually uh, did effect uh, one flight most recently, uh, the first time in a number of years. Unfortunately, um, we have to judge the Chinese Communist Party based upon um, their actions and not their words. Um, we know just recently um, two Chinese nationals were arrested in Iowa on a nationwide fraud case they were involved in. One of them was believed to have crossed the southwest border um, and was released into the country, and they made their way to Iowa and joined in this national fraud activity. Um, and I know Iowans and Americans do deserve transparency and accountability for all of your department's actions, um, which have essentially alerted our adversaries our borders are wide open, allowing criminals to enter our country and make their way into Iowa. Um, I don't think there's an excuse for having the same conversation two years in a row, and I'd like to see uh, more stringent action from the administration concerning uh, Chinese Communist Party nationals coming across our border. Um, another action I find distressing um, is that the administration is diverting a record number of federal air marshals to the southwest border to perform administrative duties. Um, this leaves Americans unguarded on commercial flights. Um, I spoke directly with the air marshals about the safety concerns posed by diverting them to the southern border, allowing for a shortage of air marshals on flights, denying them their sworn duty to protect Americans in the air. Uh, so, Mr. Secretary, um, you dance around calling um, the crisis at our southern border uh, not only a humanitarian crisis, but a crisis. Um, so if you do not see it as that, why are you deploying our federal air marshals, our FAMs, to the border and other law enforcement agencies to the border? Um, uh, Congresswoman, um, I do understand the challenges at the border, and I certainly don't dance around them. And as a matter of fact, would you call I it a crisis at the southern border? Yes, I would. And as a matter of fact, I, I work uh, every single day with the men and women in the Department of Homeland Security uh, to only strengthen the security of our southern border as well as the northern border. And we deploy personnel from different parts of our department whenever the situation so warrants and the situation at the border so warrants. When I look at uh, my visits to the southern border, I've been twice. Um, I had a chance to um, meet with the brave men, men and women at the CBP um, as well as some ICE agents, but I was um, increasingly disturbed by how many you're pulling from other agencies, not just, um, not just our FAMs, but also from um, TSA and FEMA. Um, so I, again, I think that um, I'm, I'm pleased to hear you call it a crisis. I think it's the first time I've heard you publicly acknowledge it. Um, but I think that we continue to put uh, Americans' lives at risk by uh, pulling these federal air marshals off of these flights, again, leaving um, them uncovered. Um, I think that uh, the federal air marshals certainly communicated to me that they've had enough of this. Um, they see it as deception and harmful actions, so I'll continue working to prohibit the ability to deploy um, those necessary air marshals down to the border. They need to be back on flights, Mr. Secretary, um, until you, again, certify um, that the border is um, in a crisis state. So thank you so much for appearing before our committee today. I yield back. Thank you, Ms. Stinson. At uh, this point, uh, Mr. Guest, do you have any further questions? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Mayorkas, uh, it was reported, uh, or excuse me, Secretary Mayorkas, I apologize. Uh, it was reported uh, in January uh, of this year um, that uh, at a meeting with Border Patrol agents uh, that you said that the current rate of release for illegal immigrants apprehended at the southwest border is, is above 85 percent. Right. Uh, one, did that conversation take place? And, and two, is that number accurate? Um, Congressman, uh, uh, I'm not familiar with uh, with that number, and um, uh, I, I'm not 
I'm certain to which conversation you refer. I have visited the border so very many times. Uh, perhaps some additional details would would guide me in responding to your question accurately. Yes, sir. Uh, and and, and I'll, I'll read from the article. It was a Fox News article headlines. Mayorkas tells Border Patrol agents that above 85 percent of illegal immigrants released into the United States. Uh, and it says uh, that was published on January the 8th, 2024. Uh, Homeland Security Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas on Monday admitted to Border Patrol agents that the current rate of release for illegal immigrants apprehended at the southwest border is above 85 percent, sources told Fox News. Mayorkas made the remarks when meeting privately with agents in Eagle Pass, Texas, according to three Border Patrol sources who were in the room and heard the remarks themselves. Um, uh, Congressman, I'll, I'll be pleased to provide you uh, with the data point, and certainly I don't view that article as a transcript. Yeah, uh, my, my, I guess my question is, uh, is that figure of 85 percent, is it accurate? I'll, I'll have to follow up with you, uh, Congressman, and provide you with the data you request. Well, I don't have at my fingertips uh, that data point. So you're not, you're not disputing this article. You're, you're not saying that that number is artificially high. You're just saying at this point that, that you don't have that number here to either uh, admit or deny the 85 percent that it was alleged there in the article. Um, uh, I cannot confirm, and I will do so. Um, Mr. Secretary, we've, in previous conversations, discussed Title 42, Title 8. Um, as we know, Title 42 uh, ex expired in May uh, of last year. Uh, we saw a brief dip in apprehensions uh, late May, early June. Uh, and we saw the numbers rise significantly after that. Uh, we saw in December uh, the number of apprehensions uh, on both the northern and southern border were, if my numbers are correct, were roughly 370,000 uh, immigrants um, who would have entered the country uh, just in the month of December alone. Um, and so if this number uh, is accurate, if 85 percent of those individuals who are um, uh, uh, who attempt to enter are actually released into custody, that would put the number at roughly 315,000 just in December alone. And so these numbers to me are, are very troubling uh, in that we seem to have a large number of immigrants continue to come in the country. Um, uh, after 42 expired, uh, there were some conversations that you had testifying that you believe that once we began prosecuting immigrants under Title VIII versus Title 42, that we would see those numbers drop because part of the argument under Title 42 was we were deporting in, in immigrants back to uh, their country of origin or back into Mexico, and they were then immediately returning back across the border with no consequences. And so now that 42 has expired and we're operating only under Title VIII, uh, I've not seen a decrease in the numbers whatsoever. Uh, if anything, we've seen those numbers increase. And so can, can you explain to me, now that 42 has expired and we don't have that uh, revolving door of immigrants being apprehended, returned to Mexico, and then coming right back in the country, uh, why we can't seem to get any relief, uh, why we continue to see, as what you've referred to the first time uh, I've ever heard you refer to it uh, as a crisis. Uh, I've heard you repeatedly say this is not a crisis and that the border is secure. Uh, I think this is the first time that you've said that. I know that the president said that, I believe, in uh, January. Uh, that he, not only did he say the border wasn't secure, he said that it hadn't been secure in a, in a decade, uh, which would have been there in the entire time in which he has been president, and including time in which he was vice president in the Obama administration. Uh, and so now that 42 has expired, now that we've, we're operating under Title VIII, uh, now that we're continuing to fund the Department of Homeland Security in amounts in excess that you asked for, uh, what more do we need to do uh, to be able to secure our border? Oh, uh, uh, Congressman, uh, first of all, it's not the first time I've used that terminology. I'd be pleased. Uh, we don't have the time um, uh, right now, but I'd be pleased to uh, explain to you why the numbers were as high as they were in December and why they are significantly lower uh, since then. Um, uh, there are uh, clear reasons for that. And what we need uh, to uh, strengthen the security of the border is to pass the bipartisan legislation that would provide us with the legal tools and the resources um, uh, to, to ad address uh, what everyone agrees is a broken immigration system. There has n not been, in my time in the Department of Homeland Security, um, uh, which is more than 10 years now, nor in my time in the federal government, which is approximately 22 
years now, 12 of which were spent as a federal prosecutor. Have I seen a proposal that is as tough on the border and to strengthen the security as this bipartisan piece of legislation? I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, uh, Mr. Gass. I'd remind us, uh, everyone on the panel here, that the, the second round is supposed to be three minutes, although our clock's showing up five minutes. So uh, in order we could take care of everybody, and I, my sincere apologies yes, to sir. Ms. Underwood for skipping over her and trying to be unbiased here and making sure we have equal representation on both sides. Please, uh, uh, your next question. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Secretary, uh, who was the Secretary of Homeland Security on January 6, 2021? January 6th of 2021, was uh, that um, acting Secretary Wolf, I, I believe? Yes, sir. But you were not Homeland Security Secretary on that date. No, I uh, assumed office on February 2nd of 2021. Yes, sir. Secretary Mayorkas, your tenure at the Department of Homeland Security has been historic in so many ways. Um, you face so many challenges and, and a really complicated threat environment. And at the same time, during your tenure, DHS has seized over 43,000 pounds of fentanyl last year alone, ensured the safety and security of nearly 850 million travelers in 2023, which was a record-setting year in air travel. Um, you've exceeded your goal of new hires for women in law enforcement. You've worked to keep our kids safe by identifying or rescuing over 11,000 child victims on online sexual exploitation and abuse. And yet, you faced unprecedented, vicious, and personal campaign against you and your staff at the Department of Homeland Security, um, from my colleagues on the right, and even a baseless impeachment effort. DHS is charged with work that is both difficult and essential, keeping Americans safe. And I wanna thank you for your commitment to doing that important job um, and doing it with the focus and care and attention that uh, we expect of our leaders in this country. Thank you very much for your service, sir. Um, I also just want to make a comment about um, the delayed processing times for immigration applications at the department, which has been a repeated concern from my constituents at, uh, in Northern Illinois. Every day our office hears more news about the delay in DACA renewals, work authorization for eligible migrants, and concerns about the naturalization process for those who are eligible. And you know, we encourage people to pursue uh, legal means of immigration, but we must also ensure that our processes are timely and responsive throughout that process. So last year, DHS introduced an update to the Equity Action Plan, and in the update, there was a significant gap between the annual naturalization rate and the annual size of the population eligible to naturalize. And so in that report, there were some barriers that were mentioned. So lack of understanding of the naturalization process, real or perceived inability to meet the English language requirement, as well as the lack of ability to pay application fees. Um, and I'm concerned that this means that migrants from non-English speaking countries, particularly migrants of color, are especially vulnerable to pitfalls in our process, in our naturalization process. And so um, would just ask that you direct USCIS to take a look at that naturalization gap for English and non-English speakers. Um, and also take a look at what's going on with the DACA recipients, and we'll submit something really specific for the record. Um, but if you can direct them to follow up with us, that would be really helpful. I yield back. Ms. Underwood, uh, now recognize Dr. Harris. Okay, thank you very much, uh, and thank you, Ms. Secretary. Uh, first of all, just to, to follow up on the January 6th thing, uh, you were the secretary while the investigation, congressional investigation went on, when it, the, the whole question of paid informants and embedded federal agents was brought up. Is that right? Uh, are you referring to the um, special committee and the, the Yeah, the special yes. quote bipartisan committee. That's what yes. I thought. So so you're well aware of the of the controversies involved with the with the idea of federal agents uh, embedded or paid informants and the whole Ray Epps thing. All right. Let me just clear up the 212 F uh, issue right now, because the president is the one who raised it now, because apparently he's going to issue some kind of executive order. And I'm assuming he had the same authority to issue that executive order three years ago before nine million people entered the country. Is that right? Um, I mean, he's going to issue it tomorrow. And, and, the, and the gentleman raised the perfectly valid question, like, our, our laws didn't change in the past three years, because Congress didn't do anything. God knows Congress didn't do anything on immigration. So I'm assuming we're operating under the same set of laws. So 
I just find it a little coincidental that, you know, seven months before an election where the president is down in the polls and immigration is the top issue that the president gets religion on this. So has the feeling in the administration changed on 212F? Because we always asserted on our side of the aisle that, that the president had authority under 212F. We know because President Trump exerted the authority. So is the, has the, has, and has the president sought your opinion on this? On, on his announcement last night, has the president sought the opinion of his secretary on this? Uh, uh, Congressman, uh, let me let me share with you uh, okay. one fact, uh, uh, I, and that sir, is, sir, I only have one minute, ten seconds left. Did the, did the president seek your opinion on his announcement last night that there is going to be executive order regarding his authorities under 212F? That was not the president's announcement last night. Number one. Okay. Number two, the, the okay. prior. Okay. On to the next question, because I'm not going to let you filibuster that. That was his announcement last night. It's reported in Axios, widely reported today. I, so I, my question was just, did he consult you? I think it's a simple question. I think you're being very evasive about it, and I'm going to leave it at that. Now, with regards to ICE detentions, in Montgomery County, Maryland, the Montgomery County officials twice had, an, had a person who was issued detainers under ICE, twice released from prison, now, be, now uh, charged with uh, uh, mur the, in the murder of a two-year-old, twice. What is this administration does to go to local jurisdictions and, and convince them to comply with detainers? Because as the gentleman from, uh, from Texas indicated, the title of your department is Homeland Security. I would assume protecting Americans from illegal immigrants with detainer orders scheduled for deportation is something who will go on to kill someone is something the administration might be interested in, in having. So what are you doing to convince local jurisdictions like Montgomery County to actually cooperate, not be a sanctuary jurisdiction, and cooperate with detain orders to get these dangerous individuals off our streets? Congressman, we uh, continue to work with local jurisdictions um, to persuade them that when an individual poses a threat to public safety and the individual has a detainer placed on him or her, that they honor the detainer and not release the individual onto the streets, but rather turn the individual over to Immigration and Customs Enforcement for continued detec uh, detention. Mr. Chairman, may I have um, a 30-second uh, privilege uh, to, to answer, uh, to I'll respond ask to the same 30-second privilege. The prior administration executed uh, what it believed to be its authority under 212F and the courts enjoined it. Uh, claiming my 30 seconds, has the number of jurisdictions in the United States cooperating with the 287G program increased or decreased under this administration? I am not aware of uh, an increase, any increase, Congressman. So you think it might have decreased, actually? No, I uh, stand by can, my uh, statement. If you can, if, I stand by my wow. statement. If you can get me the details, I'd appreciate it, because for all the bluster about actually convincing local authorities to cooperate, the, the most obvious sign would be that the number of 287G local authorities increased if the administration was doing anything about it. I yield back. Thank you, Dr. Harris. Uh, Mr. Newhouse. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Secretary, by statute, uh, your agency, as well as the Department of Labor, uh, administer the H-2A Agricultural Guest Worker Program. Um, based on recent DOL rulemakings uh, that farmers across the country are burdened with, DOL appears to at least not understand or not fully appreciate the uh, importance of the agricultural industry. I, for one, uh, however, would like to believe that you do, that you understand the importance of growing healthy foods in the United States, which aligns with your agency's guiding principles and responsibility to preserve and uphold the nation's prosperity and economic security. So just real simply, do you believe that the ability of a nation to feed itself is inherently more secure than a nation that relies on uh, imports to feed its citizens? I do. Good, um, thank I am not an expert in that area, but I believe in the H-2A visa process. And in fact, uh, we are expanding it uh, throughout the hemisphere 
and well, let me ask you, lawful pathway. Let me ask you a little bit about that. Earlier this year, the USGIS finalized a new rule that would increase the cost to employers utilizing H-2A, uh, among other programs. Uh, while I understand the purpose and the utility of a fee-based program, uh, the need to update uh, based on increased cost, the rule as finalized is overly burdensome and, and costly to our uh, nation's producers. Not only did the general filing fee increase, but a $600 asylum program fee was added, uh, requiring ag employers to pay for a program that they really don't receive any benefit from. Additionally, instead of just filling one form for all their workers, the final rule caps the number of employees that can be listed on each form at 25. Uh, there's no added, added benefit that I can see for this policy, and it'll only increases paperwork burdens and costs to ag employers. Uh, so now that the rule has gone into effect, as of last week, we have some actual costs associated with this rule, and they far exceed the predicted, uh, indicated 20%, uh, 26% uh, increase that was anticipated. Do you, so a couple questions here. Do you expect producers to absorb this cost, or are they to pass them on to consumers? If producers are expected to absorb these costs, uh, how do you expect them to stay in business? And if they are no longer in business, how do you and the administration plan to protect our food security when, at the time that the majority of our foods uh, served on our tables becomes imported from other countries? Congressman, um, uh, two points. Number one, um, I will allow experts to speak to the uh, downstream economic implications of the fee rule that we were compelled to issue. Um, uh, I am very sensitive to the fact uh, that additional costs were imposed uh, on uh, applicants, and I understand uh, the burden that that poses, but the U.S. Citizenship and Immigration Services uh, was really with its back against the wall, having been driven almost to bankruptcy uh, by the prior administration. The legislation provides that the fees that the, that the agency charges are to be recalibrated according to costs. I believe it is every two years, and a fee rule hadn't been promulgated successfully for over seven, I believe my time frames are correct. And so we had to make some very difficult decisions with respect to how to bring the agency to a point of financial stability, which it had been, it had been suffering financial instability for too long, which created backlogs in the administration of our legal immigration system. Um, I will follow up with experts um, to address your uh, more economic centered questions. I appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, Mr. Newhouse. Um, my understanding is our ranking member, uh, Henry Cuellar, would like to ask you one more question. Um, I, I just want to add when I said CBP, I meant DHS custody, which Understood. means CBP and, of course, ICE. And I want to ask you to please look at Title VIII expedited removal when they're under custody under DHS, whether that includes being detained, whether that includes monitoring, or even a system that allows them to check in if that is still custody. Uh, I'm just trying to see if we can do something where we can add funding for asylum officers and et cetera, et cetera, to have you do more Title VIII expedited removal. Oh, for the ones that don't qualify for asylum. So I would ask you to look into that. And we most certainly will and have um, Ranking Member Cuellar, and I know that this is an area of um, extensive litigation, uh, but we will follow up so I can um, be more responsive to you. Thank you. You're welcome, Mr. Cuellar. And I would be remiss, since we're talking about finances here, uh, without, since I thought this question would come up, but without addressing it directly with you, Mr. Secretary. After the horrific terrorist attack on Israel on October 7th, the deadliest day for the Jewish people since the Holocaust, one of your employees was exposed celebrating the attack online. It was later revealed that she previously worked for the Palestine Liberation Organization, or what's commonly known as the PLO, which is a very troublesome reputation. According to a public comment she made on LinkedIn as two months ago, she was still getting paid by the department. Could you please set the record straight? Is this person still being paid by the Department of Homeland Security? And is the status of the investigation, and what is the status of the investigation into her behavior? Mr. Chairman, um, the, the individual is on administrative leave, not performing the 
uh, the duties or responsibilities for which he was hired. The investigation is ongoing, and I cannot speak any further about it because it is an ongoing personnel matter. Can you give us a specific date on when this verdict is going to be reached as to employment? Um, uh, uh, I am not in control uh, of the investigation, but certainly I'll provide you with whatever details I'm permitted to do. So as I understand you correctly, she's still on administrative leave and still being paid. What, uh, you gotta t uh, tell me, how many total employees at the department are under investigation for similar purposes after the terrorist attack on Israel uh, after October 7th? Uh, I personally am not aware of any uh, other investigations, but uh, to provide you with accurate information, I will follow up. And have any changes been made to make sure that people of such character are not to be employed in your in your agency from here on out? Uh, individuals uh, who are hired go through uh, a clearance process in the Department of Homeland Security, Mr. Chairman. I take it you'll be tightening up those clearance processes? Uh, we, we review our uh, hiring and retention processes on an ongoing basis. As a matter of fact, I'm meeting with leadership uh, this Friday to address one aspect of them. Well, to the first off, thank you to the members who are here today. Uh, I'd like to get back to the members who have submitted questions of which you said you would go back uh, and uh, scrutinize your records and report back to them. And if you could do so within the next 15 business days, we'd be most appreciative. There may be some additional questions that members may come up with or provide in writing. We ask you to, again, provide those answers on a timely basis. Uh, I'd like to thank our, you for being here today, sir, and the su subcommittee stands adjourned. Thank you. I got it. I got it. Can't knock my iced tea over. <laughs>